Hello, it's Scott Manley here with a few updates on the world of space tourism, which, you know, I bet you some of you are interested in. Uh, I bet you there's a smaller subset who could actually afford it this time. But yeah, uh, a few weeks ago, a piece of news came out that SpaceX had apparently decided not to send their space tourists around the moon in the Falcon Heavy. And that surprised precisely nobody, because back when the original post-Falcon Heavy uh, news conference... Uh, Elon Musk confirmed that they were no longer considering human rating the Falcon Heavy because they were just going to focus on the BFR. A couple of years ago, SpaceX made this big announcement and everyone was quite excited because it happened around the same time as NASA was considering putting humans on the first SLS launch. Therefore, we kind of had this notion of a space race that might happen. There it might be a race between NASA and SpaceX to put people around the moon again for the first time. But now NASA has decided not to put people on EM-1. SpaceX is not fal- human rating the Falcon Heavy. We're waiting for the BFR. So it's still kind of up in the air, to be honest. The real question is when? Well, actually, the real question is, who is the mysterious buyer that paid all this money for the ultimate road trip trip and a potential membership in the 300,000 mile high club? But setting your sights a little lower, the suborbital space tourism market looks like it's almost ready to start delivering something. Virgin Galactic have finally started performing powered tests with their Spaceship Two and a Half, also known as VSS Unity. It's been 15 years since Spaceship One took to the skies, aiming to challenge for the Ansari X Prize. And it would be a year later, on June uh, 2004, where it would actually exceed the 100 kilometer mark and then do it in rapid succession. And following that successful flight, Virgin came in and wanted to make it a service. They took bookings. They had hundreds of people that paid a lot of money on their deposits. But there have been a lot of setbacks. In 2007, there was an engine explosion that uh, killed people. And then in 2014, when they were test flying the VSS Enterprise, there was an issue with the uh, aerodynamic surfaces coming loose and the aircraft breaking up and again killing one of the crew. But May 29th, Spaceship 2 took to the skies, lit its motor, and went straight up. It was a short-duration burn, but it did go supersonic. It did also look not like it was the most stable aircraft I have ever seen. If I was seeing this in Kerbal Space Program, I would be tuning a lot of things. But look at the roll on that. It seems that they are fighting very hard to keep control of that thing. As part of this, they also tested the feathering system and the landing dynamics and all the other stuff you would expect. But honestly, I'm thinking the design is starting to show its age. It was originally conceived to win the Ansari X Prize back in 2003-2004. Much of Spaceship One's design was driven by Burt Rutan's experience, and he knew how to build aircraft. He knew how to solve these descent problems, these, uh, you know, increase the drag, make it flyable, make it landable, and most importantly, make it viable before any of the other teams could pursue and complete their particular plans. But that doesn't mean that it's the best idea for fast, reusable suborbital space tourism. It's undeniably an awesome vehicle, and it would be an amazing experience to fly on board it. But there's a real chance that they may miss their opportunity because a new competitor, Blue Origin, is demoing an experience which might be more appealing to paying passengers. Their liquid hydrogen-fueled new Shepard rocket Well, it's a rocket. Immediately, that makes it more cool if you're a space tourist. But also, the capsule just seems to be objectively better for the passengers in so many ways. Just to start with, you have these very large square windows to really let you look around and see everything. And to be fair, you're probably going to be able to get out of your seat on both of these vehicles and do backflips in space if you like. But from a safety and reliability point of view, the whole Blue Origin experience looks a lot smoother and a lot safer. For a start, the booster is computer controlled and flies all on its own. There are abort mechanisms and the capsule lands under multiple redundant parachutes. Whereas every single emergency procedure with Spaceship 2 pretty much relies on the pilot being able to recover the vehicle and land it safely. 
And I have no doubt that the Spaceship 2 pilots are the best of the best, but it seems to me that there's a lot more hardware failures that can happen which will be unrecoverable, whereas the Blue Origin configuration has uh, far fewer situations in which the passengers can't return safely. And again, a large part of this is simply because Virgin Galactic picked the first people to have something to win the competition, but the competition winner wasn't necessarily the best way to do it. Incidentally, the Ansari X Prize is named for Anusha Ansari, who is a, an Iranian-American engineer who became herself a space tourist, although she prefers to call herself a private space explorer because, you know, she went to space and did some experiments and stuff like that. And I'm going to say... All of the private astronauts that paid their own ticket are pretty exceptional individuals who are not known for sitting around and twiddling their thumbs. And I'm sure that given the opportunity, they could all have succeeded as actual astronauts. Anyway, even if Virgin Galactic flops completely, they're not entirely out of the space game because there's another thing, Virgin Orbit, where they're planning on launching uh, rockets into space from an old 747. It was part of uh, the Virgin Atlantic fleet. It was called Cosmic Girl, and I believe that I actually flew on it once, so that's pretty cool. The rocket is called Launcher 1, and it's supposed to be able to put about 500 kilograms into a low Earth orbit. This air launch model makes it very similar to the existing Pegasus XL launch vehicle. However, this is using uh, RP-1 and LOX as its fuel, and it's expected to be a whole lot cheaper. Pegasus hasn't flown very often of late because although it was cheap at $50 million per launch, it is now about the same cost as a Falcon 9, so people will tend to go with a SpaceX launch vehicle given the option. Virgin Orbit are proposing prices at around $12 million, which kind of puts them in between the $5 million launch cost of the Electron and the $60 million launch for the SpaceX Falcon 9. And we're expecting the first test launches very soon. There are expected to be paying customers launching hardware later this year. And with the question of when the first space tourists will fly on Spaceship 2 or Blue Origin, well, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that'll be before the end of this decade. That gives them 18 months or so. And you know, if you guys have any free seats and need someone to review it, uh, I would be happy to volunteer my services. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.